Good evening, everyone. Welcome to A Word from the Lord. James over here with you. I'm glad you're with us this evening for another study from God's Word. I want to give you our, make sure I give you my contact information if you'd like to copy this program or anything you're seeing on this on this uh, uh, broadcast. Uh, a Word from the Lord at gmail.com, 276 340 2653 is how you can reach me. And if you're in the area of Eden, 250 the Boulevard is when we meet, Sundays at 9 a.m. and 10 a.m., Sunday, 9 a.m. for Bible study, 10 a.m. for worship. Thursday uh, evenings at 7 p.m. is when we have our weekly Bible study. So we hope you will come by and visit with us as well and study God's Word with us. I think we're having a pretty good uh, study through uh, the books of the Bible. We're in uh, 2 Thessalonians right now. We're going through in chronological order. Uh, and so we're starting with the, the first letters that are written and then going that way, not just Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but actually taking them the, in chronological order and going through in that way. And so puts another little uh, uh, way of studying the Bible, I guess, it gives you another perspective on some things. So if you would like, if that sounds interesting to you, we're going through the Bible. And we hope you will come out and study God's Word with us. Uh, that's, uh, that's on Thursday nights at uh, Tuvita the Boulevard. And on seven at seven p.m., <clears throat> you know, friends. I don't know uh, if you're watching the Olympics or not. I mean, it's uh, not something I'm pretty crazy about. Uh, some of the events would uh, interest me, but I'm not really crazy about seeing uh, naked people swimming or naked people ice skating, and so uh, that doesn't really uh, interest me. But uh, I do know that you know the Olympics are, are big things, a big big deal, and especially when you have individuals that are accomplishing great great things, great uh, tasks, you might say, like uh, Michael Phelps, you know. Today, uh, the great athlete is Michael Phelps. I think he has 20-something uh, gold medals, you know, one of the, the, the winningest gold medalist uh, in history, I guess. I don't know, or since they started keeping. I don't know, there might have been some Greek back there who was, uh, you know, running around Mount Olympus, and he might have had more laurel wreaths and that, I don't know. But anyway, Michael Phelps is the... You know, he's the great, the great champion of today. But in yesteryears, in previous years past, there were same, uh, you know, great athletes or great events that took place. And we, we look back on those and we say, wow, you know, that was, that was great. You know, Jesse Owens and his, uh, the accomplishments that he had, the dream team, you know, when uh, you had Jordan and I don't know who all was on that team, uh, you know, uh, playing the Olympics, and it was like, you know, yeah, America's great. You know, we're we're going to dominate everybody. And we did. You know, the miracle on ice when we're fighting the, you know, battling the Russians, and and that was just all, you know, great for the the national pride. And so we look back on those things and say, man, that was, that was great. Those were great days. But you know what? That's what we always do. We always look back and say, well, look at the great things from yesterday. Yesterday, those are the glory days. You know, maybe when, maybe now you're. 50 or 60 years old, and you may still think back when you was in high school. And boy, I had a, I could, I could, I could throw that fastball, or I could, I could chunk that football, or boy, I was a great athlete in my day. Well, that's glory days. You're thinking about the past and the, and the things that that were then. But you know what? If you look back, sometimes the glory days aren't as glorious as they might seem. When you look back at the past, you might realize, you know, maybe, uh, maybe. Things can get better. In 1912, Henry Ford uh, held on to the Model T designs. And the reason why, he said, well, they'd worked for the past four years. Now, can you imagine a, a car uh, maker now going, well, you know what? We're not going to change our designs. We've had the same designs for 10, 15 years. No, they change them. Why? Because people's tastes are different. They're trying to appeal to someone. You don't go back and say, well, let's just re let's bring back the same design because it's worked in the past. And so the problem that we often have is we start looking back and we don't look ahead. But we need to stop looking back and we need to start looking ahead because there may be better things ahead of us. Now, this is the problem <clears throat> that physical Israel, Jews according to the flesh, had. They had a problem of not looking ahead and not really seeing the glory that was awaiting them. Now, Friends, we're going to talk about tonight, we're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and we're going to start realizing how many times or in how many ways individuals today don't really get to see the glory because they're too busy looking behind. 
You know, we have a saying called, if you can't see the forest for the trees. And really what that means is you're so close to something that you're blinded by it. And that's exactly where uh, Israel of old was. They were so bound up in the law of Moses and keeping the law that they couldn't see the glory that was ahead. Let's look together, if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, and I hope that you're taking notes. I say this is the, one of the largest Bible classes uh, in the area, in the world. Uh, you can call in when we put our phone lines up and ask a question, and that'll be, your, you know, that'll be the way you raise your hand. But notice what Paul says, <coughs> excuse me, notice what Paul says about the minds of the Jews when they looked back on the law of Moses. He says, but their minds were blinded. This is 2 Corinthians 3, verse 14. For until this day remaineth the same veil, untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. And he says, but even... Unto this day, when Moses read, the veil is upon the heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn, to, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. <clears throat> uh, now let's just stop there for a moment. Here, Paul's talking about blinded. They're blinded by a veil on their mind, and the reason. Or the reason why they can't see is because it is blinded. Now, they're blinded to the glory. Now, here's what we're talking about. When Paul is pointing out the glory, he's talking about the glory of the Old Testament, the old law, the law of Moses. And he's, he's pointing out the fact that, yes, it has some glory, but if you aren't careful, you will simply still look at the glory of the Old Testament and you'll miss the greater glory. Notice in verse 7, let's back up to verse 7 here. 2 Corinthians uh, 3 and verse 7. Look what he says. He says, But if the ministration of death, written and, and engraven in stones, and that's the Ten Commandments, was glorious, and it was, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance. Now look, the glory of the Old Testament, the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments, it was glorious. But he says, if you think about it, when Moses brought the Ten Commandments down from the mountain, they couldn't look upon his face because of the glory of his countenance, because he'd been with the Lord. But notice this in verse 11. He says, for that which is done away was glorious. That's the Old Testament, the law of Moses. It was done away, it was glorious. But notice, much more than that which remaineth is glorious. In other words, if what was taken away was glorious then that which is remaining is even more glorious. But when individuals <clears throat> are so blinded by the glory of the Old Testament, they don't get to see the greater glories. They're looking at what has been taken away, what's behind, and they don't really get to see the glory of the future. They don't really get to see the glory of the, of the things that are, 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 are currently in existence. Now, so Paul is saying, look, there's a new covenant. And this new covenant is pointing to something that is much more glorious. But yet there were some who were blinded to it. They just could not see it. They just could not get over the fact that, this, that the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments, that the, the law that had been given from Mount Sinai, that it was going to be taken away. And so they were holding on to it. They were blinded to it. They just couldn't see the greater glory. Here's why. See, when Moses gave the law, that is the Old Testament, the law of Moses, his face shone. Let's go back and read about that. Exodus 34. Exodus 34 and verse 29. Exodus 34, 29. Now it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mount that Moses wist not that his skin of his face shone while he talked with him. All right? He didn't know it. He didn't know that his face was shining. And then when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come nigh him. They were scared of him. And Moses, verse 31, called unto them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. And afterward, all the children of Israel... <coughs> came nigh, and he gave them in, com in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him 
in Mount Sinai. And till Moses had done speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. And when Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he took the veil off until he came out. And uh, spake unto the children of Israel that which uh, he was commanded. And the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone. And Moses put the veil upon his face again until he went in to speak with him. Now, here's what Paul is making reference to. He said Moses was talking to Israel and he put a veil over his face. So that they could listen to him. They, would, they wouldn't be afraid of him. And Paul says the veil, the veil that's over Moses' face represents the law of Moses. And he says it's fading. It's fading. The glory of it is fading. And just like the veil hid the glory from Moses' face, now the Old Testament, the law of Moses that all of Israel was clinging to, it is keeping them from seeing the glory of Christ. Now, there's the comparison. The glory of Moses' face was going to fade, and the glory of the law would fade as well. And when the veil was removed, or the, or the veil removed would reveal that it's passing. Well, friends, this is what you need to realize. The law of Moses that was given in Mount Sinai, the Ten Commandments that everybody loves so much, you know, I talk to people all the time. Every time you talk to someone, they're talking about, well, I keep the Ten Commandments. You don't really keep the Ten Commandments. You don't really keep the Ten Commandments. Now, there may be some individuals that, that strive to keep the Ten Commandments, but they don't really keep the Ten Commandments. And they think you are just, uh, you know, a blasphemous heathen if you say, well, I don't keep the Ten Commandments. But you know what? The Ten Commandments have faded away. The Ten Commandments have lost their, their luster, if you will. There's a greater, more glorious law that's been brought in place, <clears throat> but people don't see that. Christ removed the veil of the Old Testament. That's what we read in 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 14. Christ removed that veil of the Old Testament, but their, but their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil, untaken away in the reading of the law of, of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. Now, the Old Testament is going to be done away. It's going to be removed. And if you are still blinded to the Old Testament, then you have a veiled heart. You have a veil that is upon your heart, and Paul says that's going to keep you from seeing something. But unto this day when Moses read, the veil is upon the heart. Now, friends, if you're blinded, if you're blinded by the... the uh, uh, the Ten Commandments, the law, you're going to miss so much. You're going to miss so much because you really can't see what's in front of you. Now that's the way people are today. People still have the veil over their hearts. They're blinded by the Old Testament. They're blinded by the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments. And they really can't see the glory <clears throat> that is behind the Old Testament. They can't see the glory that is behind the veil because they're still looking at the veil. They're still looking at the law. They, they, they miss the more glorious law that's been given. Now, the reason why I know that is because when you talk to individuals about the law being done away or the law being taken away and nailed to the cross, which is what the Bible says, you hear them say, well, <clears throat> that's just your interpretation if they're being nice about it. But a lot of times when they, they know that they need to be justified, that what they're doing is, has to be justified by something, so they go to the Old Testament. And then you'll hear them say things like, well, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, so things don't change. Friends, Jesus took away the Old Testament. So if you want to say Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, you can't go back and say the Old Testament. The Old Testament existed before Jesus. Jesus took away the Old Testament. But you hear people say, or think, you maybe hear them saying things like, well, the Old Testament says make a joyful noise. You know, in the Psalms, boy, I could, I could play for you clip after clip of individuals that are talking about the Psalms. Well, the Bible says play, make a joyful noise to the Lord. Psalm, Psalm 148, Psalm 150, and they start quoting the Psalms. 
Psalm, 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 Psalm. But friends, that's the Old Testament. That's the veil. That's what's fading in glory. That's what's blinding you to the glory of a new and better law. And so when people, when people say that, when they try to justify what they're saying and doing by, by the law, they're being blinded to it. They're being blinded to it. Well, David played instruments. David played mechanical instruments music. Friends, do you realize that you're getting your information from a law that is actually says to be faded in glory? You know, this is, <clears throat> this is something that you need to realize. The Bible is telling you that what you're doing is you're actually looking with a veil over your heart. You have a, a veil over your heart and over your eyes so that you won't see the truth. Now, I find it very interesting that when people, when you say this, then what they do is they call you, they call you the liar. Listen to what this, listen to what this caller says. And Matt, after I, get through, after I get through playing this video, if you want to put the phone lines up, we'll go ahead and take some phone calls. Uh, did Matt hear me back there? And does not condemn Sorry. it in the New Testament, just like uh, in the Old Testament, the law was now n of none effect. Now Sorry. we have Jesus as our high priest. And I'm not worshiping because it's a law thing or concerning the law because it's not concerning the law. <coughs> Sir, if anything, the whole point, if any, if the whole reason why Jesus, given, and let me ask you this the whole question. reason why Jesus can how be high you, priest, you, the whole reason why Jesus can be high priest is because the law changed. The law that dealt with the and sacrifices the and dealt with, changed. sir, the law was fulfilled. The, the law I'm, is fulfilled. If you say the law changed, then you're a liar. Okay, the, or, the right sir, listen. You called me a liar because you said that I said something in the Bible. I want to read it to you. And I put you on hold so that you'll listen. <clears throat> you said I was a liar when I said the law changed. In Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 11, For the priesthood being changed, there is also made of necessity a change also of the law. The reason why Jesus can be a high priest and not be after the order of Aaron or under the Levitical priesthood was because the law changed. Now, the law changed. Now, I'm not a liar, sir. You do Aaron not knowing the Scriptures. Now, this is what we're talking about, friends. Just a good demonstration. When you say the law changed, people want Jesus to be their high priest, but they don't want the law to change. They still want to be justified by the Old Testament. They still want to have that veil over their eyes. And so my point is you can't have Jesus with the Old Testament in place. You want Jesus as your high priest and you still want a veil over your face that's blocking you from the glory of the law that he brought in. See, you're blinded by the glory. You're blinded by the, uh, you're blinded by the glory of the Old Testament that's really fading in glory compared to the New Testament. Now, notice what Paul goes on to say now in 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 18. 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 18. But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now let's start with this first part here. But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. Beholding the glory of the Lord. How are you going to see the glory of the Lord? How, how do you get to see the glory of the Lord? Do you realize that when you're beholding, if you're going to behold the glory of God, you have to take a veil off? Open face. There, there's no veil on your face. It's open. You know, when the bride's coming down the, the aisles and she has, if she has a veil over her face, uh, the groom, you know, he's going to remove that veil before he kisses her. You know, he might want to remove it just to make sure he's getting the right woman. <clears throat> but see, you, you want to see the open face. You want to see her face. And so Paul says, look, we're going to behold the glory, but if you're going to behold the glory, the veil has to come off. Now, the glory 
of the Lord is seen in the New Testament. The testament that Christ has, has, has brought in, he did away with the first so he could establish the second. This is the New Testament. This is the new, the glorious law. So the glory is seen in the New Testament. Look, it's in a glass. Paul says, look, we're looking in a glass, right? We're looking in a glass, as in a glass. Now, this phrase, this phrase is not uh, uncommon in the New Testament. It's, Paul uses it and James uses it. And you know what? They both you make reference to this looking in a glass or beholding a face in a glass in connection to looking into the perfect law of liberty or the New Testament. Notice, listen, remember what he said here. Beholding the glory of God, veiled off as beholding a face in a glass. 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 10. 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 10. Paul says, But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Now, what is he talking about, perfect in part? Well, he's talking about the perfect, the complete, revealed Word of God. And when that gets here, then the things that are in part, that is, the part of Revelation, here a little bit, there a little bit. You know, Paul's writing here, Peter's writing there, and John's writing here, and Matthew's writing there. That's just part Revelation. But when the perfect has come, when the completed thing is done, then the part shall be done away. Now notice what he says. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass. Darkly. What, what's, what's the glass? What's the dark glass? The glass, the glass of partial revelation is not completed. Right? You can't see through it clearly. It's just part. It's dark. But, when, but then, face to face. When the perfect is come, you're going to be, seeing, be able to see face to face. But until then, you're going to look and see something darkly. You're not going to be able to look through it. It's going to be that veil. There's going to be some, something that's going to keep you from seeing all of the glory. He says, now we know in part. But then shall I know even as also I am known. Now what are you talking about? When you look into the law of God, before revelation was completed, before the New Testament was perfectly and completely given, you really couldn't see everything. You really couldn't see the, the law, or you couldn't see the Lord as God intended. You can't see Christ clearly in the Old Testament. Oh, you can see Christ in the Old Testament. He's all through the Old Testament. I mean, you, if you're studying the Bible, <clears throat> you're going to see Christ in the Old Testament all through it. Job talks about, I know my Redeemer liveth. liveth. Well, that's Christ, right? I mean, even all the way back in the garden, God said to the, to the woman that she was going to have a seed and he was going to bruise the head of Satan. In the very next chapter, chapter 4, Eve says, I've gotten a man from the Lord. She was looking for the promised seed. So you see Christ all through the Old Testament, but you don't see him very clearly. He's prophesied about. You know, his death is prophesied, what's going to happen to him, how, how it happened to him, where he was going to be crucified, or how he was going to be crucified, where he was going to be buried kind of man he was going to be, man of sorrows. He wasn't going to be a very good looking man. He was going to be comely in, in our side. A man of sorrows. Isaiah 53. All of these things are going to be were shadows of Christ. They were, they were giving you a picture of Christ, but it's like I'm looking through and I don't really see it really clearly. But when the perfect is come, when the New Testament is revealed, it shows Christ clearly. You clearly get to see who he is. First John, or John 1, 14. Notice what John says. John 1, verse 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. 
Now, the New Testament is what shows us this glory. The New Testament is what shows us the real Christ or who He really is. 1 John 1 and verse 3. Listen to what John writes later. He says, That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Now, friends, you can look in the Old Testament and you can find something about Christ. You can, you can certainly uh, have wisdom from the Old Testament. Things written for time were written for our learning, Romans 15, verse 4. They're, they're examples for us. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 10 and verse 6. But you can't see Christ clearly. You don't really get to behold the glory of Christ until you get into the New Testament. Now, if you're still looking at Christ through the Old Testament, you've got blinders on. You really can't see the glory. And so the Old Testament is not what we follow today. Now, I know a lot of people are going to be upset about that. They, they constantly get upset about the fact that we're saying, look, the Old Testament has been nailed to the cross. It's been, it's been finished, completed, fulfilled. But if you're looking for the Messiah and you want Jesus to be your high priest, and yet you're still back here looking through the, the, the veil of the Old Testament, you're not seeing very clearly. It's like you're going to the eye doctor and he's you know, flipping those things in front of your eyes. Better? One or two? One or two? One or two? Better or worse? Better or worse? And we're, try, we're trying to hold up the New Testament for you to see. <clears throat> look, look at Christ through the New Testament. So it'll be clear and you're going, no, I'm, I'm going to put the Old Testament up here. And I want to try to look through it. You're trying to look through a glass darkly. You're trying to look through an old foggy glass. Shadowy. You know, it's not very clear. You ever go to, into a roadside park or, you know, rest area? And they don't really, a lot of them don't put mirrors up. What they have, they have polished stainless steel. Well, you can see your reflection well enough to, See if your hair is straight. Well, I don't have that problem. But, you know, you can, you can see your reflection well enough to straighten your tie or whatever you need to do. But it's not a, it's not a mirror. It's just a polished piece of metal. So you can see your reflection in a car window maybe, but it's not, a, it's not the best mirror. You can find some things about Christ in the Old Testament. You can say, oh, I know, I know something about Jesus. That's right. But you can't see him clearly. And you can't see the glory because... Because you're looking through the Old Testament. Now, friends, why am I saying this? Because I'm trying to get you to realize that the New Testament is the law that we live by. It's what we're governed by. It's what we're guided by. The New Testament is the, or is the, is the principles that we live by. Now, I want you to listen to what Paul says. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. Let's get back to that. 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 18. He says, With an open face beholding in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory. Now, let's look at that for a minute. Changed into the same glory? Did you ever think, friends, that you could be like Christ? If you behold the glory, then the viewer becomes like what they see. That's the whole point of looking into the glass. The whole point of looking into the mirror is to see what you look like and how to change what needs to be changed. So Paul says when we look with an open face... We behold the glory of Christ and that's what we get to look like. We begin to look like what we see. James says in James 1 and verse 25, we put this up here a little bit ago. But notice this. Let's back up a little bit. James 1 and we're going to start in verse uh, 22. James 1, 22. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. 
For if by, for if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Now what did James just say? He said you look into the perfect law of liberty, that is, the word of God. You hear the word, it's like looking into a mirror. You behold what you look like. And instead of going away and forgetting what you look like, you're reminded. You remember what you look like. Listen, if you walked up to a mirror and you saw a reflection, would you recognize that as you? When you get up in the morning, you walk into the bathroom, you look in the mirror. Does it scare you? You think there's a stranger in the house? Or do you recognize, well, that's me. You know, I, I know that's who I am. That's my face. You recognize what you look like. If you saw a picture of yourself later on, you say, that, there, that's me. So why is it when you look into the perfect law of liberty, you don't become like the glory that you see? You get to see the glory of Christ in the New Testament. And when you look into the perfect law of liberty, you get to see that same glory. Because the New Testament reveals who we are. The Bible will tell you who you are, what manner of man you are, what manner of woman you are. Now, friends, if you don't believe that, you just read the Bible sometime. And if you're convicted by what you read, that's because it's showing you your true self. It's showing you who you really are. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 13. Where Paul's talking about looking into the glass. He says, we see through a glass darkly. But then face to face, now I know in part. But then shall I know even as also I am known. Everybody knows what you look like. The Bible is going to show you what you really look like on the inside. Now, I believe that's the reason why people don't like the Bible. That's why people do not like who they really are. And they don't like the man in the mirror. They don't like the man in the mirror. The Bible shows you exactly what kind of person you are. Hebrews 4 and verse 12. Look at this. Hebrews 4 and verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharp as any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and of the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's why people don't like the Bible. That's why people don't like the Bible. You know, I've, I've said before on this program about all these different versions of the Bible that come out and they change the Bible to suit them. You know, you've got, the, I guess, the women's lib Bible. You know, they, they make God a, a, a woman. You know, God's a she in their Bible. Or you have the gay Bible, the Queen, the Queen James Bible. You know, the gay Bible. You have all these different Bibles that put these different doctrines in it that will justify just nearly anything you want to justify. But when you start reading to people out of, out of this Bible, the, like the King James, they don't like that. Well, I can't understand it. You know what I say? I say people change the Bible not because they can't understand it, but because they can understand it. They change God's word because they don't like the way they look when they read it. See? And so you have people come along and, well, we've got to change the Bible, you know. We've got to take, all, take out all that hate. We've got to take out all the mean stuff. We don't like the way the Bible shows us. That's really what they're saying. What they're doing is they look into the perfect law of liberty. They don't like what they see, so they break the mirror. They try to change the mirror. Well, friends, you know what? You can go into a, you can go to the carnival and you can go into the fun house there and you can stand in front of that mirror and it makes you 12 foot tall and, you know, built like a uh, spring steel covered in rawhide, I guess. You know, you can be the 
wide-shouldered and narrow-hipped and muscular, more muscular than the Hulk in the mirror. But that's not really who you are. You can find a mirror that will make you tall, that will make you short, that will make you fat, that will make you thin. Matter of fact, I saw on TV the other day, it's been a while back, but this lady was on TV, she's on that uh, shark tank, and she actually had a mirror that she was trying to market and sell to all these big retail box stores to put in the dressing room. And what it was, it was a mirror that actually made you look a little slenderer. So when people try it on their clothes, oh, I like the way this makes me look. Look how these, these pants, boy, they just, they fit me so well. You know, takes care of that muffin top and these love handles and boy, I just, I just like this. And then they get outside and everybody else looks at them and says, man, them clothes are too small for her, him. <laughs> but it's the perception. That's what people do with the Bible. They change the Bible because they don't like what they see. But if you look in the Bible and you see Christ and you see the glory of Christ, you can become like that. You can become like that. But the way you do it is you have to conform to what the Bible says. See, by conforming to the New Testament, by conforming to the reflection that you see in the New Testament, that's how you then reflect the glory of Christ. <coughs> that's how you become like Christ. 2 Thessalonians 2, 14. 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 14. This is what Paul says. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. You mean you can look like Christ? Exactly right. You can look exactly like Christ. Now, do you want to look like Christ? See? See? I know, you know, a lot of times women, they go to the, they get their hair to cut and they'll go through magazines. My wife and my, my girls, they go through, they find magazines, you know, they have a hairstylist. This is what I like. They show the hairstylist. Oh, I can, I can put, that, put that on you. You know, you can, you can go uh, to just nearly anything, I, any, any place, I guess, that, will, that does uh, customized work on your car or whatever. And show them a picture. This is what I want my car to look like. Oh, we can do that for you. You can look at the Bible and it'll show you how to be like Christ. It'll show you how to have the glory of Christ. 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 2. 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 2. Look what Paul says. He says, Do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or need we, as some others, epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? He said, ye are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. Everybody can see you who you are. Everybody can see who you are. Now, you, are, you can be a reflection of Christ and reflect His glory. But it, has, it means you have to transform what you see here. You've you got to adapt to the reflection. Change the things that are wrong if you want to reflect Christ. Now, you say, well, James, I don't know that you, you can be like Christ. I don't know that you can, can you really look like Christ? Well, look what John says in 1 John 3. So about that, 1 John 3. He says, behold what manner of love the Father had bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Now notice this. Beloved, now we are, uh, now we are the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now, you may not know exactly what Christ looked like in, his, in the state he's in now, sitting on the right hand of God. But you can look like him by following his word. The only way you're going to be like Christ is if you conform to this word. The only way you're going to reflect the glory of Christ is by conforming 
to the glorious New Testament. Now, the problem, that, again, that we have is instead of looking into the perfect law of liberty, the glorious gospel of Christ, what people want to look through is they want to look through a filter of the Old Testament. They want to put that veil back on. But the gospel is what's going to change your lives, friends. The gospel is what's going to transform your life. Paul said in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Has the Old Testament transformed your life? Well, what has the Old Testament done for you to change your life? The Old Testament doesn't even, doesn't even reveal to you about the blood of Christ, how to contact it. It just tells you that it's coming. It tells you what to look for. The gospel is what tells you about salvation in Christ, how to be washed in the blood. How are you going to get that from the Old Testament? Why are you still looking with a veil over your eyes? Why are you still trying to reflect the glory of Christ with a veil on your face? See, the New Testament is what produces glory for God. In uh, Matthew 5, verse 13, Matthew 5, verse 13, Ye are the salt of the earth, and if the salt hath lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing, but be cast out and trodden on the foot of men. Ye are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. The New Testament is what reflects the glory of Christ. It's the glorious gospel that came after the Old Testament had faded away. The, the Old Testament was glorious, no doubt about it. But it is nothing in compared to the New Testament. Why are you still looking through the Old Testament? Why are you still looking through the veil? Why are you still trying to be glorious or glorify God with a veil on your face? You won't even get to see Jesus. You won't get to see the glorious gospel that can change your life. You won't get to see the church. You won't get to see the church that, that uh, brings glory to God. Now, here's my question, friends. Why is it, why is it that people tried to Glorify God with a veil on our face. Unto Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Tell me about the church you read about in the Old Testament. See, you want to look through the Old Testament to find the glory of God. The glory of Christ is not there. Not the real glory, not the great glory. So you have, to, you have to become like the glory of Christ through obedience to the New Testament, through obedience to the gospel. And so Paul says, look, if you're looking in the Old Testament, you're blinded to the glory. You're blinded, to, uh, you're blinded by the glory of the Old Testament. But you need to behold the glory that's in the New Testament and become like the glory that it shows. But here's the problem. Here's the problem. Let's look at one more. In 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4. Let's start in verse 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry. Now, this is the continued context of chapter 3. As we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves, <clears throat> excuse me, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, 
It is hid from them that are lost. In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Now you think about this in the context. Paul says a veil of the law is on their face where they cannot see the glory of Christ. And then he talks about Satan, the god of this world, blinding people to where they can't see the glorious gospel of Christ. The Old Testament today is a tool of the devil that is put on people's eyes, their faces, their, their hearts and their minds as a veil where they don't see the glorious gospel of Christ. You say, well, James, I don't know that you should call the Old Testament a tool of the devil. Why? The devil has used God's tools before. The devil's come along and used things that God no longer used and used them against God, God and his people. Tower of Babel. God wanted men to replenish the earth and spread, and they said, no, we're going to all come together and speak one language. We're going to build a tower to heaven, make a name for ourselves. That's Genesis chapter 11. And what happened? God said, well, if you won't do what I say, you're all speaking one language, you're all doing, doing, uh, coming together, working in unity, I'll confound the language where you don't speak the same thing, then you'll have to spread. The devil comes along, because now God says everybody should speak the same thing. The devil comes along, picks up God's plan, and says, hey, one way you get people to scatter and not have unity is confound the language where they all say something different. He comes along, Gets everybody to say, well, we can't believe the Bible, can't agree with the Bible, can't speak the same thing as the Bible, so we're all going to be different. So he, he picked up God's discarded plan and he used it. Now, you don't think that he'll come along and use the Old Testament? Christ came along and he nailed, he nailed the law to the cross, blotting out the handwriting ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. That's the Old Testament, the law of Moses. He nailed it to the cross. Took it out of the way. Christ said, I came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. I mean, he, he finished it. He completed it. Now, here's my question. Do you think the devil won't come along and say, hey, God's through with the Old Testament. Christ, Christ finished the Old Testament, fulfilled it. How can I use this? Oh, I know. I'll get people... I'll get people to say, well, we still have to follow the Old Testament today. And he puts it right back in front of their eyes so they can't see it. And so then they go along and they say, well, David used mechanical instruments of music. I can too. The devil gets you to put the veil right back on your face so you can't see the glorious gospel. You know, there's a saying, there's none so blind as he who will not see. And that's what Jesus talked about. In Matthew 13, 15. Matthew 13, verse 15. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their, heart, hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and should be converted, and I should heal them. Why are they blinded? They're blinded, by the, blinded from the gospel by the law of Moses, by the Old Testament. They still put it right back on their face. And they still look through it. Friends, you can't see the glory that's really awaiting with the law of Moses on your face. You just can't see it. You may be blinded for different reasons. Maybe there's reasons why you put the veil back on your face. And maybe because you got your own vain thoughts. You decide, well, you know what, I, I'm, I'm going to do what I want to do because I'm God. Romans 1, verse 21, notice this. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. Neither were they thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish hearts darkened. Well, you're blinded. You're blinded to the glory of God because of, of your own wisdom. Or maybe, like Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 10, Maybe it's because you don't love the truth. 
with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Is that, is that why you're blinded to the gospel? Is that why you got the law of Moses back on your face? Because you just don't really love the truth? You'd rather hold on to something that you think is the truth instead of conforming to it? What is it that's blinding you to the truth? You want to work from the Lord? Uh, hello, James. Good evening to you. Listen, this is a little off the subject, but I wanted to call last night on the program, and I didn't. But can you tell me if wrath is mentioned in the New Testament, and if it's when the thunders, it's God's wrath uh, being proclaimed? Can you explain that to me, and I'll hang up. Okay, wrath, thunder being God's wrath? Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Wrath is. Wrath is in the New Testament. Wrath is in the New Testament. Uh, I. Uh, I'm drawing a, a blank here. Well, let's just stay right here where we are right here. Look at this. Uh, Second. Thessalonians. Uh, well, this doesn't say the word wrath here. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in the righteousness. And I'm drawing a blank on the one verse that I am thinking of. First Thessalonians 1, 7. Does that say wrath? Is that a wrath verse? Uh, I'm 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 sorry. I'm yeah off subject. Uh, uh, anyway, yeah, wrath in the Bible. Ephesians five six is uh, that's not thing that I'm thinking about. Uh, for the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Yes, so there's wrath in the, in the New Testament. Thunder is not God's wrath being revealed. Thunder is it's fixing to rain. All right. So, here's a quick conclusion, friends. Chase that rabbit. Quick conclusion. What, what's blinding you to the truth? Is it because you really don't love the truth? You really love darkness? John 3, 19, Jesus said they, they hate the light because their deeds are evil. You don't want people to change the truth That's why they don't want to obey it because they know that when they look at what in the Bible, it shows them who they really are. I remember talking to uh, Larry Serber about why he didn't believe there's a God. He didn't want to believe there's a God because he knew he'd have to change. And so... He knew that if he looked into that book, it was going to show him who he really was. Friends, it does. It'll show you. It'll show you you're a fornicator. It'll show you you're a drunk. It'll show you you're a, you're a gambler. It'll show you all the things that are keeping you away from God. But it also shows you how to get right with the Lord. It shows you how to obey the gospel, how to render obedience and submit to God's will and conform your life to his will. That's what it shows you. It'll show you how you need to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, John 8, 24. It'll show you that you need to repent of your sin, Acts 17, verse 30. It'll show you that you need to confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, Acts 8, 36 and 37. It'll show you, you need, that you need to be baptized for the remission of sins, Acts 2, verse 38 and Acts 22, 16. It'll show you you need to remain faithful unto the Lord as a member of the body of Christ, which he added you to, Acts 2, verse 47. It'll show you these things. It'll show you where you are. It'll show you whether you're outside of Christ. Ephesians 2, and verse 12. It'll show you if you're outside Christ. It'll show you if you're in Christ. It'll show you where you are and what you look like, what you need to do. question is, friends, are you going to continue to be blinded to the truth? Are you going to submit to his will today? Friends, if we can help you, we want to do that very thing. We want you to 
feel free to contact us if we can help you in any way. We've got just a few minutes left, or a few seconds left. So before I go off, I want to remind you this. Uh, our tent meeting is coming up. September the 12th is when we're starting. It's going to be the, be the Monday after Labor Day. So I hope that you will make plans to attend, make plans to come out and hear the gospel proclaimed, the glorious gospel that can save your souls. <clears throat> Don't let your hearts be blinded to the truth. Let us help you and assist you in showing you the glory of Christ in His Word. We're out of time, friends. So until next time, remember to always make sure you're getting a word from the Lord. Have a good night.